Hello and welcome to another episode of the Mindset RX series of the Alpha Movement Podcast. My name is Tom Foxley and I work with functional athletes to build in the champ's mindset. These podcasts highlight the methods that I use to teach the athletes I work with and allow you to pick up the scalable, learnable mindset lessons from the best in functional fitness. Today's guest is Tony Blauer of Spear and Blauer Tactical Systems. His self-defense teachings have become respected and widespread in both martial arts and CrossFit for their applicability and elegance. I asked Tony on for two reasons. First, because as functional athletes, we experience much more fear in our training than we realize at first. Whether that's fear of failure, fear of intensity, fear of injury, it's all there and much more besides. Secondly, because he is a fascinating guy who thinks deeply and idiosyncratically. I have a lot to learn from him, so it was great to be able to spend an hour or so going deep into conversation with him. On another different note, I've had so much demand for another inner athlete performance camp that this year it's definitely going to happen, or by the end of this year, probably actually in two weeks or so, like so mid October to late October, it's going to happen. So I'm taking applications now. If you head to mindsetrx.com, so mindsetrxd.com slash coaching and apply now if you're ready to master your own athlete and take enormous steps towards your potential. And if you've got any questions or anything like that, please don't hesitate to shoot me an email at tom at alphamovement.co. So now I bring you Mr. Tony Blower. Welcome to the show. Thank you. And um, honestly, it's a, it's a real pleasure to have you on. It's, um, it's, you're someone that I've been looking forward to having on the show for a long, long time. Um, and you. just to offer a very unique perspective on the way we react to stimuli as we've kind of already touched on. So it's, it's, I'm super excited to have you on the show. Great. I'm, I'm, listen, I, uh, you know, you burst on the scene pretty quick. I didn't know, you know, who you were is nobody, you know, like nobody knows who anyone is until they read them online, especially when you're geographically restricted, you know? And I, so it's, I, just, I don't remember, you know, what post you made or whatever, but it was something like, like not a lot of stuff in, in, in the realm of, of peak performance and mindset and not a lot of stuff catches my attention after, after almost four decades coaching you know, and like quite, quite literally, uh, it, it kind of blows my mind, like that I've been actually teaching and training and coaching 37 plus years. And so not a lot of stuff, you've kind of seen everything and the way you phrase, the way you write and, and how penetrating some of the stuff is, I, like I reached out to you as like, you know, it's like, dude, let's talk. So, uh, so well, congrats to you. Thank you, man. You're, you're allowed back on the show. Now you've given me compliments. Like, I'll, I'll, I'll slip you that 50 quid afterwards as well. <laughs> Let's do that. Uh, the, uh, no, it was, uh, it, it was good. It was refreshing. Your, your approach was, uh, was uh, you know, very, very um, uh, uh, relaxing and, 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 and at the same time agitating. You know, uh, you, you get that juxtaposition. It was like, it was like, like soothing and and so you're flowing along but then also boom you know you like you hit people so so that type of uh i was just writing on a um a buddy of mine uh, a post very controversial uh person i don't know if you know david weck who developed the uh the bosu ball oh yeah yeah no and, uh, so he's a, he's a buddy of mine who lives in san diego where i live now and uh you know he's been online posting stuff and a lot of people are and and he to create a contrast he uh he he suggested that a very very famous uh, writer and coach Stuart McGill had some ideas about uh, training and weightlifting were bang on but some stuff about locomotion and movement were dead wrong and so he's had a lot of like colleagues and peers saying, dude, like, don't go after like an icon like McGill and, and maybe you should just let your work speak for yourself. And, and, and Weck is being very civil. He's very mindful. He says, listen, if I'm wrong, explain how I'm wrong. I'm trying to create a conversation. And of course this gets like most things on the internet viral and crazy. And I posted on, on his thread this morning. I said, listen, you know, an old quote of mine that, uh, I've been using for like 20 years is the wonderful thing about bluntness is that it gauges the strong and intimidates the weak. <laughs> and uh, you reframe that and said, as long as it's civil and it was a good reframe and, and where I'm going with this little rant, because it's, it's, you got to in, in the information age where we're connecting by Instagram and Facebook, 
Uh, the only way people, the only way I knew about you is because of social media. You've got to say stuff that's provocative. And what I wrote in this was that that you're the the the, the athletes and the people that follow you. They're looking to PR life, right? And it's the relationship is functional fitness. But at the end of the day, we do all that stuff to self-actualize. It makes us feel complete. It gets us through. It's our, it's our stress management or it's our whatever, you know, whatever, you know, not everybody who works out is trying to, you know, get to the games or, or win a competition. And, and so what I've tried to do, and, and I see it either intuitively through you or deliberately, is that you're trying to provoke a realization. And what I wrote to David this morning is people can realize things or they can have a realization. And the realization is almost, is almost always the, the result of a, uh, some dramatic confrontation, mm-hmm. right? You realized that you should have worn your seatbelt as you were flying through the window. And you lived and you'll never not wear a seatbelt, right? So the realization happens dramatically. And good writers can create that, that moment where you read something and you're like, holy shit. And now you create a realization, so... That's my rant. I'm out of here. Get your dog yeah. finished. <laughs> the two minute interview. <laughs> so on, on that note of realization as well, um, where's your realization of the impact that you could have with, with the work that you do? You said where or when, um, when and where, where was, was the story behind it? Um, you know, it's, it's funny because, uh, I, you know, I, I, I talk about this a lot where, where I just, I knew this is what I was going to do. My mom asked me when I was like 15 years old, I was like on the floor trying to, you know, work my splits and more flexibility. And I'm looking at Bruce Lee magazines and this is like 1975. And she says, uh, Hey, what are you going to be when you're, uh, when you're older? You know, you, are you, have you decided you're going to go into your father's business? You're going to be a lawyer. You're going to be a doctor. What are you going to, and I said, Oh mom, I'm going to be a martial artist like uh, Bruce Lee and develop my own self-defense system. And she pat me on the head and goes, okay, dear, we'll talk about this when you're, when you're older. I just knew, but you know, I could have been like teaching Wushu or, or Tai Chi. I could have been one of, you know, and, and my fascination was, uh, um, was always with practical self-defense because that tied back to, I felt like I was more afraid of everything than anyone else in the world. But growing up in the sixties and I, you know, I was, I was, I wrestled as, uh, you know, uh, um, you know, all the teams in school for, you know, uh, competitions for, you know, physical fitness stuff, wrestling, gymnastics, for track and field. I grew up on skis. I grew up in Canada. So you're either a skier or a skater. I was a skier. Uh, I've been, I'd been skiing since I'm one and a half. By the time I was in my teens, uh, on the trajectory that I was on, there were many people who thought maybe I was going to represent Canada in the Olympics one day. I was like, you know, but I sabotaged every event. I never won a thing. I hardly ever placed. I was so afraid to win and I was so afraid to lose that it, it, it stymied uh, that flow that we talk about now in these days, like that, that perfect you know, mindset state where you know, you, your ego and pride aren't there and you're just thinking about the movement. And, and it was interesting, Tom, because I, you know, I, do a, I do a lecture when, when I work with, uh, uh, within the CrossFit community or with fighters, with, with uh, 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 cops, military. We do, we do a, a very specific block on the neural circuitry of fear and understanding the psychology of fear versus the biology of fear. And, and uh, one of, the, one of the, the questions I ask people when they start to understand the scope of this, how that the amygdala and the limbic system, the reptilian brain actually has more control over your cognitive brain than you want. And what we need to do is, and that's this special reframe that I believe we've been able to create is this harmonious relationship between the cognitive brain and the reptilian brain and get them to work together mm-hmm. and, uh, and respect each other as opposed to fight it. And, and so the, one of the questions that I ask, uh, you know, tactical athletes or, or, or athletes is what is the way to fear? What is the way to fear? And, um, you know, it's, so if we ask, for example, in, uh, if, if someone is doing, uh, um, uh, Murph mm-hmm. and I say, how many, you know, in a class, how many of you have done Murph with, with a vest? You get like half the class. How many of you have done Murph without a vest? You know, all the class I go, which is easier. 
right? And they're like, duh. And, and so I go, what if fear was like a weight vest? The fear was like 22 pounds to whatever, you know, random weight. And the, the example, as we go through it, they start to realize how you wear your fear because the first time you put a vest on, you put it on too tight. Like if you were never in the military, you're never in law enforcement, you don't know how to put a vest on, you know, you put that vest on and it's on too tight. And what happens when the vest is on too tight and you start to run, you go to run a mile, you can't breathe properly. So you can't breathe properly. That changes like, you know, oxygen to your brain and blood flow and all that. You start to panic a little bit, even if it's subtle, people will slow down. And what happens is you swing the pendulum, pendulum far to the other side, you loosen the vest too much because it's an emotional reaction. And what happens if you're running with 22 pound vest and it's too loose, it's sloshing around and banging around. And now you're grabbing it by the collar, trying to control it. And so what happens is if it, if the vest is on too tight, you can't breathe. If it's on too loose, it's smacking up in your throat. It's choking you. It's distracting you. The vest is fear. And you've got to stop at some point and learn how to wear your fear because there are a lot of events in life that you need fear. And so this is an interesting, you know, uh, uh, spontaneous tangent I'm on where, where what a lot of people do is, is they think that if they're really trained, that they will have no fear, like the old t-shirt line, N-O, fear. And, and so we do a seminar called No Fear, but we spell it K-N-O-W. No fear, look at fear, get to understand fear, and how this ties all the way back now. So that's me, you know, talking at 57 years old. Now I go back to me at six, seven in a wrestling tournament, me at 10, 11, 12, 13 ski competitions. I thought that everyone was telling me how good I was. And I was thinking all along in my mind, but I never told anybody, if I'm so good, how come I'm so scared? Mm-hmm. And that fucking scared the shit out of me the whole time. So I would, I would ski with that weight of fear and I always wiped out or I always went too fast. And, and, uh, and, and I look at most, and there, I think it was one of the things that I, that I really dug about your writing and your message is I look at a lot of the performance coaches and to me, their stuff is so f- like a, a lot of it is just so foo foo fluffy or esoteric. It's not it's not dynamic. It's not penetrating, and it doesn't invoke or inspire realization. So, like that was you know what triggered the the impact that I've had, and I'm grateful for in other people was because the first student was me. I was just tired of being afraid all the time. I was always looking for, and what I realized was a lot of the uh, a lot of the stuff was just psycho babble, and and it was a um, you created a codependent relationship with a mantra or or a guru or 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 you know you know especially athletes like we're the most superstitious. Where's where's my lucky socks? I can't go to my where's my lucky, right? And I would always and so at, at a certain point, you know, I would tell the athletes I was coaching like your lucky rabbit, those socks didn't win the race for you. You did. Right. And getting people like really to understand the, the physiological response to fear and the, their, their cognitive assessment was it is like, they don't need each other. I was, I was coaching this girl uh, who called me up and she's freaking out. She's going, you know, like I'm going to die from like the fear. I can't do this. She had this big event the next day. I said, has this ever happened to you before? She goes, yeah, all the time. I go, so you know, it's not going to kill you, right? Like, this is just the pattern that you run. So do like, like, but here's the thing. And, and, and I'd love your take on this. Um, and I know I didn't answer your question, but that's the, that's the way I go. Uh, the um, is, so I train a lot of fighters and, and what I love about, I think it's interesting because, because I'm dealing with the suddenness of spontaneity of like, like that violence, which, which, which could knock you out or injure you, you know, so a lot of stuff you can do if you've got the time to have a ritual, like, like, uh, like if you're a golfer and you've got a performance coach, right. You know, you got like months leading up to the tournament to work on some stuff and now you're on the greens and you're, you've got a putt. Right. And you're like, you can take your time and look at which way the grass is growing. (laughs) Right. But in a fight, you don't have that much time in a, in a, in a, a a time domain competition. You don't have that much time. You've got to, you know, I I wrote something a a couple of years ago that, you know, all movement is mental and on game day, it's all mindset because you're not going to be a different athlete the day, the moment you step up to the, to the plate. 
And, uh, and so this, this whole thing is, is about this like mind, this attitude of adaptive courage and understanding that the opposite of courage isn't cowardice. The opposite of courage is discourage D I S hyphen courage, because our internal visualization says, Oh, I must not be ready because like I'm out of breath. I'm scared. My and we haven't taught people how to really communicate. And this is what I was talking about earlier, our cognitive brain and our, our reactive brain need to hold hands. They need to, they need to work together. And this was the question I was going to ask you. Um, Maurice Smith, I don't know if you know the name. I don't know if you're into it. So he won a USC. He was a, one of the top uh, uh, Thai boxers in the world, K1 fighter, you know, really. So I interview fighters because I, I like to ask them questions about fear. Um, and, and, uh, and it's interesting because, I, you know, I do it as a researcher, but then I get great stories for my seminar. So here's a great story. So Maurice is uh, uh, getting ready for a fight. He's got headphones on and he's just, you can see by his body language, he's not listening to death metal. Like I'm in a, in a, in a, a, a fighting locker room and you can see like one athlete is sitting on a, on a bench, his knees, you know, up and down, not like, like, you know, he's nervous. Another guy's punching his face. Another guy's pacing. And there's Maurice like lying on a massage table, you know, with his hands behind his bed. And you can see the way he's grooving. He's listening to some like R and B. So, uh, so I talked to him and I go, hey, dude, I got to ask you a question because I study fear. And uh, I go, uh, like, are you looking at your body language, looking at everyone else's, totally different? Are you afraid before a fight? And uh, he looks at me, he says, uh, can I ask you a question? I'm like, yeah, sure. He goes, do you have a job? I'm like, yeah, I do. He said, are you afraid to go to work? I go, no, I'm not. He goes, me either. And puts the headphones back on. Right? Like, what a cool thing. It's like, this is my job. Why should I be afraid? Now, you're smiling and people listening to this might go, well, that's super cool and what a great scene in a movie. But here's what I, when I'm training trainers, and they all get sucked into that story and it's a true story, I go, what if I now took all your fighters and I made them listen to, to uh, Maurice Smith's soundtrack, Rhythm and Blues, and they had to lie down on a massage table and just chill before their fight? I bet every single one of them, maybe maybe with the exception of one, would fucking lose. You know why? Because we changed their ritual before their ritual could be changed. At the end of the day, we got to find that balance for what what supports us. And then as we mature, we go to like, do I need to hold on to this? Do I still need these lucky socks? Do I need to be angry before this event? Do I need to, you know, and, and, and to me, that's that's evolution. That's just maturity. You know, so, so the, the, uh, uh, you know, the, the kind of rhetorical question is, is about that. It's about these, these, these rituals where you tell people, Hey, this, this will work for you as opposed to, you know, it's, it's like nutrition or anything else, right? You, you've got to find ectomorph, mesomorph, you know, what's your physiology and stuff like that. Sorry about that rant. I mean, take a breath in like 10 minutes. Um, but there are like 19 questions and thoughts in there. That's a good rant. There's um, a knowledge filled rant. I'm, like, I want to go back to the middle of it. And um, yeah. you, you talked about wearing your fear. And that's, I, I really like that. It's, um, it fits so nicely with, with uh, the idea of intensity tolerance as well, which like, the way I see it is familiarity at the baseline, then like your internal self-talk and your, what you can manipulate and then like vision at the top. But the familiarity and the self-talk is, is essentially um, what I think you can manipulate in that response, but on to know where you, or, um, was, was there anyone who taught you to wear your fear? Oh, wow. You know, this is like, I wish you wouldn't have asked me that question because the, the answer is obnoxious. I mean, life taught me. There mm-hmm. wasn't like a, there wasn't a, there wasn't a mentor. There wasn't a, it was like, like just the way like my psychological makeup was, was, like, I want to do that. And people go, how are you going to do that? And I go, and then I would go figure it out. Um, so the, I don't know if this is relevant. I never thought about it in these terms, but like, I really, I really, really care about people. And I really, really, uh, you know, I've almost, so I've been, you know, teaching 37 years. If you ask my wife or the people close to me, how many times did I leave an event? 
you know, just imagine how many thousands of conferences I've talked at in four decades. And, you know, I mean, one year I was on the road, 260 days. Crazy. That's, you know, a crazy amount of seminars. It's like a deployment. And, and um, if you ask my wife or the people really close to me, how many times I finished a lecture, a seminar, and went, fuck, I knocked that out of the park. That was amazing. Versus, shit, I didn't get to this. I did go over this. And, and I'd be, and you know this, uh, any passionate speaker, like you're, you do go do, how long are your summers? Full day? Yes. So it's some are half days, some are, some are going to be longer. Yeah. But, but even like a, a four day, as you, as you get acclimated to four day, it'll be fine. But when you give a good full day seminar, you're done. Mm-hmm. Like you just want to go eat, maybe have a beer, a glass of wine, go to I'm a like that after two hours. It's intense. Yeah yeah. It's, yeah. 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 And so people don't realize that. Uh, until you start doing it, but um, uh, I would never finish high five myself and go, "Wow, I was so good there!" Right? It, it was. It was always, "What could I've done better? Mm-hmm. What could I've done better?" I've had people in my so I've got a, like a, a our military and law enforcement division. You know, I've got like twenty trainers that help me around the world teach teach our, our research. But you know, I've got an amazing team now. But several years ago, I had some guys on the team where. I would literally, the Sunday night before the course started, we'd be on Skype. There was no Zoom and other stuff. I was on Skype. And I'm going over the course. And these guys are professional trainers. And you could see them rolling their eyes and sighing. And I would always remind them, guys, this course isn't for you. It's for them. Right? They're the ones fighting. We need to, let's, let's try this drill like this. And you could see the guys that are no longer with me are the ones that were rolling their eyes. And, like, they're the ones that were happy with good enough. This is okay. We're okay. Like, who's going to know? Um, and so uh, uh, it's like that's been my mindset since since I can remember. So if you go back, like, I was born in 1960, you can start with, like, I was just afraid of, of, like, every event, any confrontation, I would get, like, a sphere spike, and it would bother me so much. But nobody, even today, people don't talk about their own fears. Um, but back then you just, you never did. In fact, you know, I remember one, one very, very important ski race, my coach, I'm just like shitting in my pants. Like I want to projectile vomit. I'm standing at the top of the hill above the tree line. You know, the wind is howling. We're getting ready to go. And he says, how do you feel kid? And I went, great coach. Like you just lied about that shit. Right. And people still like, how many times have you seen somebody you can see on their body language, something's bothering them. Mm-hmm. The whole time. Go, how are you doing? I'm good. I'm good. Right. You know, and people were just used to saying that, but imagine, and this is kind of an interesting thing for this talk because, because you're a mindset coach and you work with athletes, athletes out there. Don't fucking lie to your coaches. Don't lie to yourself. This is so you can't, you can't do anything if you don't accept self-awareness and, and emoting and in a, in a way that's productive because your coach can't help you if you don't, tell him or her what your fears are. And I, and, and so I lied to my coach. I went down, I wiped out and, and, you know, got disqualified and, and didn't win another race. But I was told that, uh, by one of the timekeepers, you know, they, they, in, in major races, they time you at different sections. Guy comes down, he goes, man, when you passed me, like at that, that's like too bad you wiped out, man. Cause you were like two seconds ahead of the guy that won the race at this point in the race and like two seconds in a giant slalom race is like a mile in a car race. And, and, uh, but it was just like, once again, I was going too fast. I caught a tip. I fell so hard. I fell through the finish line, but I missed three gates. Right. It was just crazy. Um, but what it was is I was afraid, but I lied to my coach. I lied to my coach. And, um, and, uh, uh, this just triggered this other story. And I think it'll really resonate with, with your listeners and maybe, hopefully inspire better questions and maybe uh, uh, requests for, for you to dig deeper or explore in your seminars with them. I'm, I'm, I'm training this fighter for an amateur kickboxing match. In an amateur kickboxing, the, uh, the fights are three rounds, but a title fight is four rounds. And so this is his first title fight, and his name's Sean, and we're in the, we're in the uh, uh, dressing room waiting to go. His gloves are taped. He's shadow boxing. He's moving around. And I look at him, uh, and one of the officials comes in. He goes, 15 minutes. Door closes. It's like in a Rocky movie, and it's all scary. My heart's pounding. I'm more afraid than my fighters are, right? And, uh, 
And he goes, uh, I go, hey, Sean, how are you feeling? And he's standing there on his toes and he's shadow boxing. And he goes, he goes, uh, I'm good coach, you know, but I, and then my guys know how, like I've talked to them, they know, don't bullshit me. He says, I'm good coach. You know, I'm nervous, of course, but I'm good. And I go, well, Sean, you're supposed to be nervous because you're about to get in a fight. Somebody's going to try and punch you in the face. Right? <laughs> and you're going to try and punch him in the face. You're supposed to be nervous. You're going to use that adrenaline. You're going to use that fear. That's good. He goes, thanks, coach. And he keeps going. Great. A nice little talk. Not that, not me at 15. Great, coach. Good, right? Like, no lies, right? But I am sit down and I'm talking to my corner guy and something starts to nag at me, Tom. Like, just like, like this intuitive, right? And I tell people, remember the three eyes, instincts and intuition and intelligence. That if you trust your instincts and you rely on your intuition together, that it's a tactical trinity, you're going to do something intelligent. So something's nagging at me, and I realize there's something that there's a conversation that hasn't happened. And I look at Sean, I go, Sean, I know you said you're nervous, but what exactly are you nervous about? That was my intuitive question to him. Because he could have been nervous of it was his first title fight. His girlfriend was a ringside. His mom was watching. He didn't sleep. Maybe he had an injury he didn't want to tell me about because he didn't want me to pull him out of the fight, right? Like, mm -hmm. But I wanted to know because that changes strategy, doesn't it? Mm -hmm. Absolutely. If we lay it on the table, now it, you know, it, 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 it impacts strategy and how you think and how you move. He says to me, would have never have guessed this, he goes, um, I've just like – Never done four rounds. I'm wondering if I have enough gas, enough stamina and endurance to go four rounds. He said, of course, like I train for 10 in the gym, but, you know, fighting in the gym with sparring partners isn't the same thing as in the auditorium, right? Mm -hmm. And uh, I'm like, holy shit, I would have never, ever guessed that that was what he was fixating on. And so I said to him, I looked at him, I said, can you do two rounds? He goes, what? I said, can you fight two rounds? He goes, yeah. I said, so just do two rounds twice. And he smiles and he says, okay, at the end of the second round, I look at him and we're inside. It's a 16-foot ring. There's a foot on each side, so you're 14 feet away. You can hear the other corner. Mm -hmm. at, the end of, at the end of the second round, I said, can you do two rounds? He said, yes. Just then, we heard the other corner spider say, coach, what round is it? Like, at that moment, you just knew you were winning, right? It was like a, like a, a, like a scene in a bad boxing movie. It was so cliche. But this is what... This is, you know, I know you're digging this, and I hope your listeners are too. The mindset part of this is everything. How you think affects how you feel. How you feel affects how you think. Both influence how you move. So huge. When you start working with an athlete like that, what's the initial process? How do you, how do you get to know them to begin with? Um, the, uh, in, 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 in the fight community or just in general? In, in general. Um, like I've always just been a coach, you know, so I, you know, I, I was, I was pretty good at tennis. I was pretty good at skiing. When I was 15, I was like a professional ski instructor. They had made an exception in the insurance at the, uh, at the, at the ski hill that I worked at because I was like under eight. Um, I just always loved coaching people. You know, I'm going to write an article, uh, one day I've been joking about this for two years now that, uh, um, uh, uh you know, coaching isn't cheerleading. Right, like yelling at your athlete, you can do it. It's not really coaching, and and uh, I was actually uh, uh, having a talk with uh, with uh, Ben Bergeron last year, and uh, we were just talking about like you know uh, coaching principles and stuff like that. And one of the things that that I use with the trainers that I coach, like who are part of part of my like self defense world, is I say this: the progression. Is interesting. It's tech, It's technician, trainer, coach. Technician, trainer, coach. And you need to. The technician is all about like you know cues and, and points of performance and and get your feet here and get your, you know. But the the trainer understands how to program stuff. But the coach is all about performance. And most people call themselves coaches, but they're really technicians. And a lot of people call themselves coaches, but they're really trainers. There's very few people that understand coaching, and that is when you look at somebody like like I help I've helped I've helped some guys at the games, and we realized that like one year one of the athletes I was working with, it was his, it was his fifth year at the games, and I just started working with him the year before, um, and through our self defense stuff, it was really interesting. But he went out and he just bombed on a snatch ladder in the tennis stadium, and uh, I went up to him after. And it was too late to do anything, but he said to me, I realized today 
that my fear isn't the snatching competition. My fear was the tennis stadium, right? And it was interesting because had he been able to, this is what we come back to self-awareness in the athlete. If, if he had been able to talk to me about that two weeks before the event, I'm not saying we could have done anything, but, but just talking about it changes it, right? Um, you know, I had a, uh, and I'll give you guys like a, like a tip and example. How many times have you seen pictures of, uh, and it's, it's usually the more elite athletes that get the, they get the, uh, they can just walk past security because people are like, they're the celebrity. Yeah. Like what you'll see, you know, an event where like one of the stars in the, in the, uh, let's say the fight, you see him like in his jeans or clothes in the octagon or in the ring or in the, in, and he's walking around testing things and moving. He's in the ring, right? You've seen pictures like that. You know yeah. yeah. Like why don't, why aren't there pictures of like all 16 people on the card doing that? Because they don't have the clout to get in there and or they don't have the experience to know that just going into the place where battle's going to be before calms you. Because when you walk there, you're not overwhelmed. There's not, there's not the same sensory uh, overload. And so there are things you can do, but only if you talk to your coach about the shit that makes you afraid. Like, hey, you know, can I go four rounds? Oh, by the way, Sean won the title that night. Yeah. You know, so that, so, but, but had that conversation not happened, maybe he misses his, his kick count because he's worried about his endurance and, and will he be able to go four rounds? Cause he never talked to his coach about that. Right. You guys track on that. Yeah. Yeah. yeah it's, it's fascinating to me. It sounds I, like gone. I'm saying I, I probably didn't even answer your question again. I just, got, <laughs> that's you, cool. fired, you fired me up Tom. That's good. That's what I want is I, I'll just let you, let you run with it for the next yeah. however long. And so it sounds like the, and it, it's, it's so obvious when you say it, but I don't think it's applied anywhere near as enough that when you coach well, it's listening. And it seems like you listen to your athletes better than most, which is why you are where you are now. Um, are there any, uh, firstly, have you always been a good listener to yourself and others? Because I know that's a, a big part of it. Uh, no. Sorry, what was that? No, I was going to say shit. No, uh, <laughs> and, and you you couldn't tell I was a good listener by this by this interview um, <laughs> because I haven't answered any of your questions. Um, the no, I, I you know what it is 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 I had this this uncanny um, situational awareness where and a relentless um, kind of pursuit of the truth. And it's impacted my relationships because I know when something's wrong and, but the other person often doesn't. Mm -hmm. And so I'm like needling them going, no, listen, I can tell. I just know it was, it was, it was weird. And it wasn't like, you know, like, uh, 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 like I always, I always, um, make a joke when I'm walking down the street and I see a, uh, like a store for, uh, you know, the, uh, mystic, mind reader what are they called again like uh uh yeah i know the type of people you mean yeah yeah yeah, yeah. and uh uh psychics right mm -hmm. you know you know come uh, walk-ins available you know the psychic shop and and uh so always whenever i walk by whoever i'm with i go i wonder if they knew i wasn't going to come into their store right now. <laughs> I, like and and so uh um uh so it wasn't like the psychic thing but but i could look at somebody and go and go I, I know there's something holding this person back. I know there's something here, but a lot of people like it might be like they'll talk about it in two days. They weren't ready 48 hours early. They were still, the idea was still germinating or whatever, whatever it is. So I wouldn't say that I was uh, um, always a good listener. Definitely not. I don't even know that I'm a good listener now because I just get, so freaking excited about the shit, but I want people to fucking win. I want them to win and win. I use the acronym from Lou Holtz. Great, great, great coach. Win isn't like I got to win. Win is what's important now. His acronym for win is what's important now. And, and in self-actualization, you always need to be thinking about how do I win? What's important now? Um, and if you do action, happen to win an event, you know, that's, that's super cool. But all, all that does is like, like, like I had a really interesting talk with uh, Brian McKenzie. Um, and uh, you're just talking about how the uh, anxiety and depression and, and uh, you know, mental issues in, in top, top performers, because when you peak and then that, 
that that rush of being the best in the world plateaus or now you're not, that's hard on your, your psyche. That's hard on your ego. Um, and again, this comes back to this relationship with fear that I alluded to early. Uh, I, I really think this is a, uh, an important thing, this whole reframe of, of, of no fear, K and O W and understanding that the opposite of courage is discourage because it's the story we tell ourselves that we can't. And that this is it, and it's over, as opposed to having more of a. I don't know if you read the book, "The Obstacles Away." Yes, you know, but having that that, uh, and that's really when I, you know when I read that stuff, I went, "Oh shit, I didn't know that." Like the, something in me, for better or worse, uh, gave me this this intuitive stoic approach to life, where where uh, like whatever whatever obstacle I had. As, a, as an athlete, as a kid growing up or whatever, it was like, okay, how do I, how do I not feel this way again? Mm. How do I, how do I fix this? I don't want this to happen. Or, and, and then, um, I started by, 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 I guess the serendipity of, of, of one's life story is that I started teaching self-defense at a, at a super young age. And because of my fear of fear, right. I would, uh, impose that way of thinking on every single one of my students. They were my guinea pigs mm -hmm. where I would say, Hey, like, and I say it more, more structurally sound now, but back in the day, what I was trying to say was there's no evidence that what we're practicing actually manifests itself in a real street. So we need to reverse engineer our fighting based on how the bad guy moves and blah, 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 blah. And so I created all these crazy drills that put us in these scenarios where you couldn't excel if you didn't manage your fear first. And that became, that became the timeline that I think applies to any, any type of uh, uh, competitive athlete, which is, starts with situational awareness, meaning what is my event? And then the fear spike. And the fear spike could be performance anxiety, the sudden, like, you know, you know someone comes out and goes, your next wad is this, and you go, oh, shit. You know, I hate thrusters, right? And you, you're dealing. So it goes situational awareness, fear spike, your management functional movement and i really look at like in anything that's pushing you everyone will get a fear spike and a fear spike you know might be dramatic sounding but that moment where you suddenly realize okay the game is about to start and now you found that you just did one of those little right and that little you took a deep breath and just kind of like kind of kind of cleared your mind but that's the fear spike right okay let's go you're up right and so it's situational awareness so i know what's going on around me and, and uh, fear spike, fear management, I got to manage that. And now it's functional movement. Nice. I love that. Um, that's, that's put so much clarity into like just that little, like almost like flow chart has put so much clarity into what I do. So I wish I'd explained it like that earlier and much easier. Yeah, <laughs> um, well, well, you can, you know, like, uh, like, you know, just use, use, use that flow. I mean, at the end of the day, a great coach, and I hate the term, I like it. A lot of people like, you know, they'll hear me talk and they go, I'm stealing that. I go, don't steal it. I hate thieves. Right. <laughs> and they're like, but what you can do is, is you can, you can use it and integrate it and just, and, and share it responsibly like, like an author or a speaker. I love, you know, Dan, you, you know, who Dan Millman is, he wrote the way of the peaceful warrior. Yes. Yeah. So Dan Millman said, if you face just one opponent and you doubt yourself, you are outnumbered. And it's like, it's one of my favorite quotes because all it speaks of is about fear management. If you only have one opponent and you doubt yourself, you're outnumbered, right? You got one thing to do, but you don't believe in yourself. Boom, it's done, right? It's going to be, it's not going to be your, your best work. And, uh, but I quote him in every single seminar I do. And I always, depending on the seminar, how long it is and the relationship I have, I, I, I'll say like, Dan Millman pissed me off when he said this because I wanted to say it. That's how good it is. It's so good that I can't even change it. Like, and so, uh, yeah, I mean, we're supposed to inspire each other and that's what a real, that's what a real, uh, coach will do. Um, at the, at the end of the day, you know, our, our, the, the, the product of our effort is going to be seen in the results of the people we, we meet, right? If you're a coach. Like, are they do, are they better humans? Are they better athletes? Are they, you know, are, are they growing? Are they evolving? So. 
You mentioned a stoic mindset earlier and that kind of ingrained stoicism and like, and to link this in quite, quite nicely, actually, I think I also learned that stoicism. Um, but mine was through when I was a kid, I like long story short, but I just had the shit beaten out of me every single day, which is partly why I wanted to get you on the show as well. Um, and you can imagine what that was like, but I think, well, now I know in, in hindsight, that that happening to me was the well is the reason I am doing what I am now or part of the reason it definitely built resilience and despite the um the the embarrassment and the hardship of it all it eventually created more beneficial thought processes like far afterwards um the reason I'm kind of going down the street is were there, were there any um, hardships that you embraced at that time that, or that kind of created that, that philosophy within you? Yeah. So, um, you know, it's interesting just to talk about your, your experience and, and, you know, there's a lot of people, this, this always fascinates me, but you know, you know, you get beaten up, you're, you know, you live in a shitty place and, and you got to, wherever you're, it's walking to school or it's some, you know, stepbrother or some, you know, family thing or some, and like, why do you, why did you turn out? And this is kind of like a rhetorical question that, that you, I don't, I don't think you or I know the answer to, it's just the way it is. And, 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 you know, where someone else has the same experience as you and they grow up as a predator. Mm. They're, they're a bully, they're a predator. You, 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 you grow up and you're like trying to make the world a better place. Right. And so that's, that's an interesting thing. And it's something that, that I want, like, you know, anyone listening to the show to go like, you know, in, in some of this like cliche, like fortune cookie crap, like, you know, it's, you know, not what happens to you. It's how you react to them and like, all, and everyone goes, yeah, whatever. And, but at the end of the day, that's what it is, but it comes back to your relationship with fear. Mm-hmm. And choosing to to actually look fear in the face and and go okay, you know what exactly am I afraid of? I got to face it now. Do I understand what this fear is? Like what you know? Am I, research it, tear it apart. Then if you need to do something, and the timeline is short or the timeline is long, long to realize that you that that your progress in life it isn't isn't dependent on whether you have fear or no fear you know uh whether you have fear or no fear in this it's you've got to do this and sometimes you need to be wearing your fear you need the fear with you and when you apply those first face it understand it control it right confront it and control it then you get to a place of k and or w fear and um and 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 you know, we could sit down on a whiteboard and draw all these things up. And we have this, this chart called cycle of behavior. It's kind of a cool thing. If people Google, you know, Tony Blower cycle of behavior, they'll see this, this flow chart for fear. And, and, but we would see your experiences there as a kid getting beaten up, Tom. Mm-hmm. And you would see how some people stay in the fear loop and they stay uh, 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 fetal emotionally or actually physically. And they're just there and this is their life. And then there's other people who somehow see this like out, this like little light and they go towards their, they're moving. And that's what we just got to teach people. Um, you know, that's, that sort of stuff. So, so, you know, it's, it's impressive, if, you know, from your, that, that background that you're doing what you're doing and, and you turned out, you know, like, cause you're doing really good stuff. And, um, but for me, it was almost, like there wasn't like some, like I could list a bunch of the time that I was beaten up, the car accident that I was in where somebody died and I didn't. And, and, you know, the, like, and all these like things like, the, you know, uh, I had a, 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 a giant slalom. No, a, yeah. Giant slalom. No, a downhill race where I wiped out and uh, landed on my head, knocked myself out, kind of woke up in the hospital, cracked my helmet. I mean, just, you know, concussion, uh, you know, there's like all these events that I've had. Uh, um, 2010, I was running, I built my company up to a $12 million company, multiple staff, 21,000 foot training facility. Had my company literally like stolen from me. Um, you know, 
like from Friday CEO of this company to on Monday, zero income, zero company because of some, you know, uh, nefarious bullshit that, you know, you know, one of, one of my staff did with, with a part uh, and like my, my family's crying. My, like, what are we going to do? And uh, I was speaking at this, uh, counterterrorism conference in San Diego and, uh, so we'd lost everything. So I dissolved the company and, uh, and it was one of these things where, you know, this isn't a business like, uh, you know, uh, I- I interview, but you know, I, I had a partner and I had a, uh, one of my, one of my team had vested equity in the company. They did a deal behind my back to transfer something mm-hmm. and it just killed the company. Um, and, um, uh, uh, but I went from like, really successful, like t- staff at 12, 21,000 foot, $12 million a year to like from Friday to zero, like two days. Like that crushes most people. My wife says to me, she's crying. What are we going to do? Are we moving back to Canada? Oh my God. And I said, uh, we're going to move to uh, San Diego because if we're going to be homeless, I want to be homeless where the weather's pretty much guaranteed, like perfect. And she likes laughing through her tears going, are you crazy? And that's what I did. I, I moved us to San Diego and rebuilt the company from scratch. Um, and uh, uh, I just, so I, I could list from this happened to me when I was seven and this happened to me when I was 10 to this happened to me when I, this happened to me when I was 50. Um, and uh, um, I don't know what it is. I, I'll tell you this, like, like while it's happening to me, I'm fucking nauseous. I don't like it. I'm like, shit. Right. You know, but it's, it's one of those things where, you know, like I've got to fight, I've got to figure out a way, a way. And it's the Lou Holtz win thing. What is the most important thing I can do now? Mm-hmm. Right. And, and, uh, you know, it's, it's, it's not hiding under a desk, hoping that the, uh, the Calvary is going to run in. I was on a, I don't know if you know, uh, um, uh, who Jack Donovan is, but he wrote this amazing uh, article called Violence is Golden, very controversial. But, you know, he had me on his show. And um, one of the things he said, when I, like I, I told people, like there was a time in our history where all of us knew how to hunt and kill, where we, we didn't serve you. If we didn't understand how to survive, we were dead, right? And it's not that many, it's not that long ago, but we've all become domesticated. And what's been weaned out of us is this Maslow's hierarchy of needs, you know, perspective of like, how do I survive? How do I get through this? And, uh, and that's been, but inside our DNA, I believe all of us are, uh, you know, have that in us. It just needs to be reawakened. Um, and so for, for me, I, 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 for, for better or worse, uh, like that's just the way I always I always thought, but I really believe, and this is, this is why I'm such a like insanely passionate coaching when I'm working with people who, who like the scariest thing that you could do isn't, isn't going to be like a thruster Murphy, you know, couplet. It's like somebody trying to rape you, somebody trying to beat the shit out of you, somebody trying to move you to secondary crime scene. And so we use self-defense as a transcendent vehicle to teach people how to manage fear and apply that to any part of their life. But I've had, so many people in front of me like crying going, I don't know if I could do this. I don't. Right. And so it's, it, it's never, it's never about the movement. It's always about the mindset. Mm-hmm. Yeah. It's a story that's attached to it. Um, right. Yeah. Yeah. I couldn't have said it better myself. Yeah. So they're like, so, you know, in a time when we can either next time I'm over in the UK, if you're over here, we'll get together for, for, uh, if I'm there, we'll have a beer. If you're here, we'll have a coffee. Um, but the uh, but just to talk because that's that's stuff fascinating to me and interesting to talk about. You don't know that that when I do my seminars, it's it's really a sequence of stories because people remember a story instead of a formula, um, and uh, and you and you can connect to the story. But there was something in you when you were going through all of that, getting beaten up and 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 all of that that was actually shaping you know who you are today and and. Uh, and while you're not teaching self-defense, you're still teaching that mindset of, of how a winner needs to think, how a fighter needs to fight and prepare and train. And in this case here, the community that you're directing your focus at right now, you know, the, the battle is between time and weight, mm-hmm. right? The movement, so, you know, so uh, it's the same thing. It's still a fight. Mm-hmm. I completely agree. I completely agree. Something I wanted to... Uh 
to pick your mind on is why the um so to come back to that same scenario um and i know we've kind of going over time a bit so if you need to jump away we can jump away but um the um when i was in that scenario my instant reaction was to completely seize up and no matter what i thought like because I'd, I'd go into like it was at school so i'd go into school with this idea of okay this is what i'm going to do if it happens today this is what i'm going to do or when it happens today this is what i'm going to do and no matter what the no matter what my intention was it would just not happen so uh, what what kind of thing is happening with fear in that situation and why would that happen um so i'm not I'm not entirely connecting to the question. Go for it. Okay. So you're saying you're, you're, when you go to school. Okay. So I'd, I'd have this, um, this, this uh, idea of, okay, this is how I'll fight back. This right. is what I'll do in response. Um, right. But no matter what, it would be that someone, someone, well, one person attacking me and I'd go, oh shit, I'll, I'll hide back and I'll try it. Like I wouldn't even try and get away. I'll just like lie there and take it. So, yeah, why, so why do people do you're that? You're asking like, why do I think that would happen? Yeah. Um, uh, you, you know, it's, it's super, it's super interesting. I think, uh, you know, I, I don't have, first of all, I don't have a clean answer. Mm-hmm. So that's, you know, yeah. just the, uh, the, your uh, amygdala wasn't fully uh, yeah. developed. And so the, uh, you know, like, no, it's, what's interesting to me is that um, it's, when we come back to the opposite of courage is discourage where, where what I tell people is like, you know, it's the story that's playing in your, in your mind, the movie in your mind, right? So before the fight, the movie was, I'm going to kick his ass. So that's like our scenario is fights coming up. And the first two, two blocks in our cycle of behavior chart is motivation, expectation, mm-hmm. and visualization. So motivation, yeah, if those guys touch me again, I'm going to defend myself today uh, and I'll kick his ass. And then I'm visualizing this. And then right after that kicks in the fear loop. And the fear loop is another block that's made of, of, of beliefs, neuroassociations, how our brain links up symbols, and then um, how we just look at embrace fear. Um, so I've had, you know, in, in, in the last few decades, or mostly we've been law enforcement and military, and I've had cops come up to me. I had one, one SWAT cop come up to me. He'd been in a shooting. He was point on an entry. And they thought the guy was asleep, but somehow they had telegraphed their approach. He got up. He had a shotgun. They opened the door. Uh, uh, the door was unlocked, so it didn't breach. He comes in. They think he's in his bedroom, which is where they had, they had seen him last. They open the door, and he's standing in the hallway with a shotgun. And they look up like he's just taking his hand off the door. It's like, so he's got one hand on his rifle, one hand like on the doorknob opening it, and there's a guy like 20 feet away with a shotgun. And it's come, it's, it's up here. And as they're moving in, he pulls the trigger. And the guy who's point here flinches out of the way. Number two gets hit with the buckshot. Number three shoots the guy and kills the guy. So I'm at this lecture in Chicago, this tactical conference, and I'm talking about when a stimulus gets introduced too quickly, regardless of whether it's a butterfly or a bumblebee or buckshot, if a stimulus gets introduced too quickly, your body's survival system will always choose safety and it'll move you away from danger and it'll bypass cognition. And uh, so you can say, I'll do this when he does that. But if something happens too quickly, your reactive brain intercepts the cognitive plan, right? Uh, Famous boxer Joe Lewis said, everyone has a plan until they get hit, right? And so you had a plan until you got hit. And there was was just a, a disconnect, a disconnect in your preparation and your visualization and um, and uh, you know so so it, it is just an interesting thing this SWAT cop who you know you, you you don't you don't accidentally find yourself on a SWAT team right there's a selection process there's like the training he comes up to me after the conference and he says uh, and he's like the last guy to leave and you can see he's really distressed and this had happened five years ago and he's still thinking overthinking it and he said he said to me and you can see he's, he's holding back a r- real emotional face. Like his eyes are a little glassy. He's trying not to cry because he's a cop, right? He's type A. And he's going, you know, this happened five years ago. He said, can you say that thing you said again about the stimulus? I said, yeah, when stimulus is introduced too quickly, the body's reactive brain takes over and it bypasses the cognitive brain. And unless through 
happenstance, accidental, incidental, or training, stress inoculation, replicating the event, right, physically and psychologically, there's no guarantee that you're just going to do something just because you said, and um, uh, as you experienced. And so uh, he tells me a story and he says, I've been thinking I've been a coward for five years because that my buddy got shot. I go, dude, first of all, like, like you can't be a coward and be on a SWAT team. So get that out of your head. Second of all, had you not moved when he fired that, like you had your left hand on the doorknob opening a door and your, and your right hand, you know, holding your long gun, had you stayed straight because you're supposed to not, not, you know, don't be afraid, no fear, right? If that shot hit the guy in the vest behind you, that would have been your face in front you'd be dead right now or maimed or disfigured or whatever. Your body's physiology actually saved you. And the last time I checked, based on your story, the score was good guys one, bad guys zero from a guy who tried to kill some cops. And uh, I said, listen, like we need to, as a, as a, as a community, especially in the, in the, uh, uh, the personal defense, self-defense, combatants community, we need to understand that your physiology rules your body. If that's what unites all of us. And your, your awareness is compromised, but your physiology can actually move faster than your brain saying, hey, block this punch. But it was a really interesting reframe because he thought his, he wasn't prepared, his training hadn't repaired. And if I tie that to your story and you telling me, is like you can visualize all you want, but the, the speed and aggression and suddenness of a stimulus can put you into this, what I call emotional inertia, this, this locked up state where you're fixating on, oh shit. And, and listen, the, the, the primal response of sudden danger is to cover your head. So like even pro fighters will do that. Like in a ring or an octagon, they get surprised at something. You see them, they, you see them cover on, it could be on the ground. It could be against uh, uh, the ropes or whatever. So what, you know, what we've, what we've done is reverse engineer drills from there, what we call off balance to on balance training off balance emotionally psychologically and physically and you incrementally you work from uh capacity to potential through these through these drills um and so it's, it's this gradient learning process that creates this bedrock of competence um and had you known me back then and said to me at 12 years old or 15 years old this guy keeps punching me out what i'd have done and this is an interesting thing come back to the first question you asked me how did this all start i had a student that i was training he was having a bully issue in school, and um, his dad asked me to teach him, and uh, I said, sure. He gets into this, this uh, uh, fight in school, and um, bully, you know, trips him, and it gets in his face, and Mitch says, you know, I don't even know you. You know, what are you, why are you harassing me? And the guy's, what are you going to do about it? And Mitch, who had been training with me for almost three months, which is like the time that somebody would sign a fight, and you fight three months later. Mitch, and so we had been sparring and grappling and kicking. Mitch grabs him in a moment of emotional, you know, get, you know, like, like defiance, grabs the guy, slams him up against the locker bank in school and says to him, just leave me alone. I don't even know who you are. You've been bugging me since the beginning of school. Just fucking stop bugging me. And he's, so I, I come to his private lesson and Mitch says, I got beaten up today. And I'm like, what do you, what happened? So he tells me up to that part. And I go, well, what happened after you said that? He goes, he punched me really hard in the face and I fell down. I go, what do you mean you, he punched you in the face? Why didn't you block? Like, you know, why didn't you bob and weave? Why didn't you do? And here's what he said. And it's, it's hard for people to visualize this because this is only audio. But he had grabbed him in that moment of defiance, standing up to the bully. He had grabbed him with his left hand, pushed him against the locker bag. Guess what was in his right hand? Oh, all, the school, <laughs> all the school books. So imagine boxing somebody where you're holding on to them with one arm and you got like groceries in the other arm and their hands are free. Like how easy a fight is that? The guy just sucker punched him right there, dropped him. So here's what I did. And this, this will give uh, uh, you and listeners an inkling into what I mean by reverse engineer. Instead of me saying, Mitch, why do you compromise your hands? You know, man, that's what, that, and that's what, like, that's what the technician trainer would say. Mm -hmm. You got too close, you compromised your hand. Here's what the coach does. The coach, I looked at him and I said, Mitch, 
I'm sorry. She goes, what are you sorry for? I didn't prepare you properly. I was teaching you a bunch of moves. I wasn't teaching you how to look at a scenario. What are you talking about? Are those your books? Yeah. Get your books and grab me like you grabbed him. And what we did is we reverse engineered the actual fight so that he had a three-dimensional connection. I didn't say to him, never get in a fight in school again, or the next time you get in a fight, make sure you drop your books. Like, like that's not realistic. We walk around holding our girlfriend's hand, holding our kid in her hand, groceries, uh, gym bag, and shit happens in the real world, not on a, on a, on a wrestling mat mm-hmm. where it's, everything's like freaking perfect, right? And so we, we reverse engineered the whole thing because what I was doing, I was, I was erasing the potential for repeat helplessness. The education was in doing the scenario and doing it off balance and working through that. And so, you know, you know, the, uh, hopefully this is this is cleared. But that's actually that was 1980, and that's actually the moment that that jump started my whole approach to self defense because I had this epiphany. It was like the God of War shot me with a lightning bolt. When I apologized to him, it was because I realized that I had been teaching self defense wrong. That I'd been teaching a series of moves. That you that's that's like that's like me giving you a hand, that's like me giving you a hammer and nails and a screwdriver and and buying you a toolbox and saying that you're an architect, right? Mm-hmm. Like just because I teach you how to hammer and nail doesn't mean you know how to build anything. And so understanding the architecture of violence makes us safer. But just un, just if we're a handyman that can hand and you know so that's like I got all these kicks and punches and blocks and everything, but I don't know context. And, and uh, I don't know structural safety, like as the metaphor goes. So those are, those are, those are the, uh, like the, the deeper high level. And this can be applied to, you know, any, any, any fitness competition, any workout, anything like that is where you look at your scenario and you reverse engineer for me to get through this obstacle course in my mind. What are the skill sets that I, that I need to do? What, you know, how do I perform that? And, and one of the biggest hurdles is an area that you're attacking and that is, if, if we don't if we don't understand how to manage fear, we can't accept a challenge. It, you know, like fully, we can. We there's some people that get through it through duress, right? You know, and they hate every workout, but they keep doing it because they know it's good good for them. And then there's people like you look at a, like a Rich Froning or or an Annie, Thor's daughter, right? That are like you know seem to be always smiling and enjoying the pain and the agony, right? Um, But it's not the same for the, for, you know, the, the rest of us mortals for the most part, but everything is mindset. And, and I think that's, uh, that's what attracted me to your work, Tom. What a place to finish up, man. That's perfect. Um, Thank you so much for your time, Tony. Can you, can you tell, um, tell everyone a bit more about where to find your work and, um, and what's coming up for you? Yeah. So um, uh, if, if, uh, if you I mean, our website is Blauer Spear, B-L-A-U-E-R-S-P-E-A-R.com, Blauer Um, There's like a, a ton of videos if you want to see some of the work, if you're interested in the personal defense stuff. We are, exciting stuff is like this. You, you, you know that I've, you know, you know, very close to the CrossFit community since 2006. Um, and we've been uh, running self-defense programs for uh, CrossFit boxes. So we're, we're relaunching our be your own bodyguard program, which is kind of this safer in the day uh, concept, which uh, has been quite controversial because, you know, the MMA jujitsu traditional martial art community freaks out when somebody hears about a one day self-defense seminar. And what they're doing is they're unconsciously uh, uh, assuming that we're teaching martial arts in a day. Mm-hmm. Right. So you can teach, you can learn CPR in one day, right? Four or five, six hour CPR course, first aid, and you've got the skills to save somebody's life, but not yours. What we've done after three decades is figured out a way to teach personal safety in a day, just like a CPR course. And so it's situational awareness, it's verbal de escalation, fear management, and some primal gross motor move. And it's not replacing martial arts or love or passion for martial arts. Right. So you can teach somebody how to snatch at a PVC and maybe a kid's bar or a women's bar, maybe a, you know, regular Olympic bar, but you know, they, they can't enter an Olympic, you know, competition and, and pull off the snatch, but they can learn it in a day, but they're just not good at it. So, you know, learning self-defense can be done super, super quick and it just makes you safer in real life. But it's, it's, uh, 
you know, it, it doesn't make you, you know, uh, like CPR, you don't take a CPR course and pretend you're a doctor. So I just want to reframe that there because people are like, what, you can't learn in a day. Yeah, you absolutely can. You can learn to detect and avoid, defuse and deescalate, and the push comes to shove. You can learn how to explode and hit somebody really fast and, and, and use your fitness to get the hell out of there, right? Uh, by, uh, and, and we don't, when you're running away from danger, we don't care if you heel strike either. So, uh, but, uh, so that's, that's exciting things for the, you know, for that community. But we're, I mean, we're, we're all over the place, man. We're, uh, we're busier, busier than ever. Uh, we just launched, uh, a, uh, kind of an insider behind the scenes. Look, we, we, we started a channel on patreon.com, uh, P A T R E O N patreon.com forward slash Tony Blower. Uh, and it's all like, like talks with people, questions about fear, questions about training, um, and, uh, you know, interviews and podcasts and, and little tips and stuff. So we're really busy, really exploring like, uh, online learning and stuff because geography and finances does restrict people from just training with anybody at any time. So super busy. That sounds great. Sounds, sounds fantastic, man. Thank you so much for your time. Thank you, man. This was great. Appreciate it. Thanks for listening to another episode of the Mindset RX series of the Alpha Movement Podcast. Remember to check out the Inner Athlete Performance Camp at mindsetrx.com slash coaching to hear more about how you can create the champ's mindset and learn to embrace hardship. Hardship? Hardship. Instead of shying away from it, become more consistent, uh, develop self-beliefs that actually help you or develop belief processes that actually help you achieve instead of self-sabotaging. Anyway, I'll see you soon for another episode of the Alpha Movement Podcast and the Mindset RX series.